What is up, Green Bay Packers fans, and welcome back to another episode of The Daily Draft, brought to you by Badger State Brewing in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and welcome to our very first, you guys have seen the prospect primers, you've been uh, very excited to join us on Mock Draft Monday, but I'm even more excited to be joined by Justice Mosqueda of Acme Packing Company and you know, usually a billion other things, podcasts, things of that nature. You've seen him appear with Andy Herman a number of times on this very show. We're going to do our first positional preview where we go into guys that maybe I didn't initially have on the prospect primer list, guys that jumped out at the combine, which we're not even, you know, all the way through when recording this. You guys are getting this on a, on a Tuesday, but uh, we've, we've seen the numbers so much as they are. Not a lot of the useful ones. Um, very few guys ran agilities and and if anybody knows anything about the sub seven three cone, it's Justice Mosqueda. Justice, buddy, how are you? I'm doing all right. I'm at the uh, in laws right now because my water heater blew up and it uh, soaked through a wall. So I'm out of commission for a while. The good news is it, it got screwed up right before I went to Cabo. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Okay. That's, that's not terrible. We were going to do right here who is Justice Mosqueda, but. Uh, yeah, if you just want to like briefly run down kind of what you got going on, I, I kind of forgot that you're a pack a day like regular. So I don't know <laughs> that I don't know that we need to, you know, get get super deep into it, but there are some people that are just here uh here for the draft. That is kind of the way things roll. So go ahead. Yeah. Uh started writing basically like right out of high school. Um got some work at places like Bleacher Report and stuff like that. Um, ended up consulting with a couple teams. Um, worked with the XFL for the 2020 version of it for about three years leading up to that, was the head of analytics um, for the personnel department there, and then a uh, pandemic hit. So, you know, we had to find new jobs. I ended up writing for um, Acme Packing Company, SB Nation site, uh, basically, you know, a, a blog covering the Packers, and that's what I'm doing full-time right now. So I've been doing that for going on three years now. So. This is the, this is the gig. Most excellent, and love the folks over at APC. You guys do uh, awesome work. Enjoy reading uh, everything that you guys do, and occasionally listening to the pods as well. As I, you know, long drive, listen to the boys over at uh, over at APC. Um, okay, state of the edge room. You're my edge guy. Uh, it's it's kind of your niche. You've been a, a big pass rush guy. Um, they just used last year's pretty pretty high. I mean, you know, Green Bay doesn't pick in the top half of the draft often, and then you get the two-spot bump up because of the Rodgers trade. You know, I, I think, boy, um, you know, you talk about LVN, you talk about Rashawn Gary, and then I think you got to go back to even like A.J. Hawk when we're talking about picking, you know, kind of that high in the draft. And they took a toolsy guy that, that that's going to be at edge now in Lucas Van Ness, and I, I think he's kind of your longest-term building block, though, they did just uh, extend Rashawn Gary in a very serious way, so he's going to be around for a while. And then Preston Smith redoes his deal to stay a part of the crew. I, I listened to, um, you know, try, try to be a pro here, listen to your discussion. We're going to actually discuss a couple things that you have already discussed um, with Andy on the Packaday uh, podcast feed, but you, you talked about maybe they might want to move on from Preston, may, maybe, or at least it's a conversation. Not going to happen. And and I yep. I was on the other side of that just because of the I, I would have had the move on from Preston discussion had Enigbare not blown out his knee that that made me much less likely to have the let's move on from Preston discussion but that does bring me to our next point and and you did see um, the Packers prefer and and most teams would prefer to have four guys going you want to keep your your pass rushers fresh uh, Enigbare and Lucas Van Ness definitely kind of that second group. Of, of outside linebackers in the um, Barry scheme. Now they'd be the second group of defensive ends in the Barry, in the Halfley scheme, but there is no Enik Barry. He blows out his knee. Sounded like a clean, you know, they talk about a successful surgery all the time. Talk about a clean ACL tear. Does seem like he maybe has a chance to be one of those nine month or 10 month guys, but it's still a playoff injury. It's still right. half season, you know, either way. So, um, and nine and 10 months too. I mean, remember when Gary came back, like, it's not like he had a full pitch count immediately, right? right? Like he's, yeah. I, I think anything from Manic Barry is gravy at the, truly I do. Yeah. Um, so the first question I'll ask you is do any of the other guys 
make sense moving forward. Any of the other, you know, I know Brenton Cox is on the team. They've got a couple other bodies there. Um, you know, if, if edge is not addressed in free agency or the draft, how do you kind of feel about the room? Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, you brought up the Preston thing. I want to hit that on the front end. Cause I think it's worth talking about. Preston is a guy who always got, uh, Praise from the coaching staff for his versatility. And we are now in a scheme that does not really value versatility for the ends, right? It's all about pass rushing. He's not dropping um, you know, anymore. Yeah, exactly. And the whole edge setting thing matters a whole lot less when you're going to be in single high. And, you know, that that nickel, um, if it's in a condensed set or, you know, Sam linebacker or, um, you know, drop down safety is now functionally – you know, the guy on the edge and you just want to like spill everything to those guys. Right. So the scheme is going to change up a little bit. So I I think, you know, going to Preston and giving him that incentives based contract, right. uh, Or contract adjustment um, was a good way to go about it. Right. Because I don't think you could have brought Preston back on the number that he was at. And this at least gives him a chance to be able to make back some of that money or even more. Right. Like if, if he hits 10 sacks, I think he ends up making more money than he would have um, with without his contract being adjusted. So um, gives him at least a shot. Who knows if he's actually going to, you know, hit that number, right? Um, but then behind him, I, I do think that there is some concern because this defense, and I don't know how much you guys have talked about it. I've talked about it with Andy a lot, right? Um, once you get into single high, what everyone's going to want to do is run crossers at you. Right. Everyone's going to want to, hey, we line up here and we go all the way over there because, you know, if you're running cover three, we run off one guy and then, you know, hey, you know, you have an outside linebacker or something on the backside who has to cover that crosser. Or if it's man coverage, that's a really hard route yeah, to cover. You and that the middle of the field there. safety isn't really helping there. Right. Um, that's kind of running underneath that middle of the field safety. Right. So your pass rush has to get there before you can complete that crosser basically right it's ba- it's basically a timer um so that puts a lot of pressure on those pass rushers and that's why you look at you know what san francisco's done what the jets have done what houston's done they'll pay whatever you need to to get a pass rusher look at the niners they're paying for guys off of the bench the jets have plenty of guys on that defensive line right yeah. they, will will mcdonald they took him in the first round with a pick that you know we swapped with them and that guy barely saw the field the Texans traded all the way up um, for Will Anderson, right? And basically mortgages their future to make sure that, you know, not only can we get a quarterback, but we can get a pass rusher too. It's not really a position that you could be weak at. So, yeah, I, I think they're going to need another guy because I'm assuming Enigbare is at best going to have a limited pitch count all next yeah. season um, yeah. when it, whenever he does get on the field. I, I, I totally agree. I think they're going to add to the room. I think they have to add to the room unless they really, really in love with Brenton Cox. And I don't, honestly don't even know how much Brenton Cox fits into what they're doing now. Um, and, and I kind of want to discuss the what they're doing now about it because um, you know, Twitter or X is certainly a place to get into these discussions. But I had been one of those people that you talked about that um, when I heard four three defense, I thought, oh man, okay. So because because I love the bendy edges, right? I was a big Brian Burns over Rashawn Gary guy, and I don't know if I ended up being right or wrong on that. It doesn't really matter, but like, I was in the same camp as you for whatever that's worth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and so like you know Brian Burns over Rashawn Gary, I loved Harold Landry. I don't know how much that has gone on, but like that style, right? The more mm. the 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 pretty edge, <laughs> the, the beautiful, uh, you know, around the, the shiny, the glittery, yeah, yeah, exactly, and um, you know the the uh idea that I had in my head then was okay, Reggie White, Sean Jones, Vonnie Holiday, Aaron Campman, like those are the body types that are going through my brain. And then I thought you made a really good point when you talked to the Andy where you're like, hey, these, you know, these idiots like Ross Uglum out here on on X, uh talking about these big edges, that might not be the case because you you you're exactly right. Um the Jets burned huge draft capital on a skinny edge. The Texans draft burned even more draft capital extra draft capital right. on a on a small edge uh and, and you, you can talk about bryce huff you can talk about some of the other guys like my Jai sanders and other dudes that are on that texans roster randy gregory go, for the niners i mean he's got to be playing high 230s right now like, yep I'm, and you I'm mentioned you mentioned you know bosa is not as big as people think bosa is basically on green bay's minimums from you know the right. the other the other era so kind of Break this down for me. This this sort of discussion. I you know people 
that I talked to this morning, it, we're, we're still argumentative about it and, and just say, no, I, I think it's a, I think it's a goody thing. This, this 260 plus six, four plus broad jump, it's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a goody thing because I made the point that, you know, they, they were fine with uh Fackrell. They were fine with Vince Beagle. They were, they tried Carl Bradford mm-hmm. for, for God's sake. Uh, <laughs> when capers was the guy, clay, Vince, Fackrell, Bradford, you know, even the, the later round guys that didn't work out and got moved inside, like Nate Palmer, Brad Jones, these are 235, 240 pound pass rushers that were true three, four outside linebacker types. Then Petten comes in, or if you're of the other mind, then Goody comes in. It's a, it's a real chicken or the egg situation. So if you kind of want to break down your, your theory or sort of reiterate some of the things maybe that you talked to Andy about. Yeah. I mean, they certainly did get bigger on the edges in recent seasons, but I think what it boils down to is just that mindset, right? It's, it's that timer starts on the beginning of every single play and it's going to be, Hey, can, can they throw the crosser before you get to the quarterback? Right. Um, and when it boils down to it, man, there's not that many six, four, 270 pound guys who can get to a quarterback fast enough to stop that, that, you know, crossing route. Um, so it's going to need to change. Um, if it doesn't, whew, I don't know. Like, shout shout out to the personnel staff for being able to put to put that team together. If you know they could stay that big and still get after the quarterback, right? Um, one thing I will say, one I think it's kind of overblown a little bit um, in terms of the edge class not being good this year in the draft. I've seen a lot of those comments being made. I don't believe that. Yeah, um, I don't know. There's don't not know. like that top, maybe top five guy, right, in this class. Yeah. But I think there's there's plenty of guys that can help. The other thing, too, um, just talking to people who work, you know, either in consulting or agents or um, with teams. This free agency class for pass rushers is going to be really good. And guys are going to come flying off the board. And it's going to be a situation where maybe if you want to find a guy a little bit below market value, that's a spot that you can do it um i don't i think the edges are going to be flying off the board early on in free agency because that's where a lot of the money is going to be paid and i don't know if these guys are going to be able to sit and say hey you know we're day three four five in the free agency i have this contract on on the table let's wait and see if we can get a little bit more money like the money's going to dry up at some point so i i think these guys are going to sign early it's going to be a position that um, is targeted by a lot of people. So I don't know, like maybe they clear up enough space that they can sign a guy like Huff who is going to hit the free agent market or something like that. And that's not inside yeah. knowledge, right? That's and, not me reporting or anything like that. But right. That's a possibility, I think. A couple of guys Justice is talking about, and hey, a lot of, or a number of these guys might get hit with the tag. Um, but right now I was talking yeah. about uh, expiring contracts. Josh Allen with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Brian I would Burns. bet he gets hit with the tag. Yeah, yeah. he's yes. getting hit with the tag. <laughs> yeah, Brian Burns with the Carolina Panthers. Daniel Hunter. He, he actually might be available. I, right. He's enormous. He's not, but he might be available. Um, talking about Bryce Huff. Um, Chase Young, I believe, is on an expiring yeah. deal. He's not going to get hit with the tag. I mean, the Niners might want to bring him back. One guy that is an absolute dude that I don't know if enough people talk about is Grenard from the Texans. Mm-hmm. He is a good football player, um, but but I think Uche is up. I mean, there Leonard Floyd is up. There's there's guys there, and and you're right. right. I mean that you know um, Green Bay did it with Whitney Merciless, I, I, and mm-hmm. that was an in season deal. But I I think this like a veteran fourth edge would not totally freak me out with the Enigbari situation. And I think a lot of people are kind of focused on, okay, do they re-sign AJ Dillon? Do they bring in, you know, a veteran back? Or if they're not going to bring in a veteran back, they might want to bring in like two secondary pieces. If they bring in three guys in free agency, one of them very well might be, and I mean like outside guys, not, not, you know, guys that played here before, but um, I think that there's a chance it might be an edge. And I think that would surprise some people. I think it would surprise. Yeah, I mean, again, you just kind of kind of flip the mindset of just kind of how these defenses are structured, right? And now yes. that fourth pass rusher, that that guy is a significant contributor and can win or lose you ball games, right? Um, yes. So that's it, it, just kind of changed yeah. that mindset a little bit. And as you mentioned, the run, the run defense things are are different because even in a four two five, you know, generally on the strong side, you have that that you know 
that that overhang safety. He's your 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 edge. Your I'm not talking about like edge defender. I'm talking about your force player, your edge guy. That's mm-hmm. your strong side safety on the backside. It's the nickel. It's not. It's no longer the actual defensive. You know, quote unquote defensive end. If you're not going to play a ton of too high. So yeah. it, it, the, the run defense responsibilities are are different. Um, and the, and so, that whole idea of, you know, playing that big end on the strong side, you know, you're going to play the under, you know, 4-3 under like the Seattle Seahawks and stuff like that, right? There's so much motion in this league. You can change the strength yeah. very quickly. And it's not yes. like you can flip an entire defense like that, right? It yeah. just ends up becoming, okay, hey, you know, next guy rolls down. Um, so you can't really pick and choose what side you want to have that kind of like big end on. Um, and that's something worth thinking about, especially, you know, you're seeing, I don't got to tell you guys, I'm sure you guys have seen plenty of charts and heard plenty of nerds talk about it already about how motion helps NFL teams and offenses right now. Right. And it's yes. increasing year over year over year. So um, even as much as the last quarterback hated it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's again, a, another data point. So I, I understand why, Packers fans think 4-3 defense, defensive end, and the first picture in their brain is Reggie Wayne. Yeah. Yeah. That that's a great defensive end. Yes. And no one will ever take that away from him, right? But that's yeah. not necessarily kind of what this defense is looking for um in the structure of uh, you know, 2024 NFL. I ended up watching a bunch of Halfley snaps too, um, or his defensive snaps in base. I actually watched them yesterday they kind of got away from it at BC, like the first kind of four ish weeks of the season, they ended up playing a lot more base than they did the rest of the year. I don't know why that is necessarily. Um, but the way that they played it, I mean, you know, if there's a tight end, those guys are playing inside the tight end and they're rushing the passers still, and they're spilling everything and everything's either going to, um, the strong side, right. To the tight end, right. Usually they're lining up either that Sam linebacker and he's walking down and you're playing a little bit of an under, but, um, they're not really changing up personnel, you know, you know, left and right in terms of that, that big end. Um, and then on the backside, it's that drop down safety. And when they play nickel, it's the nickel replacing the sand. It's, it's not that difficult to kind of figure out from a schematic standpoint. So, yeah, I, I, I still think defensive end, you're going to think pass rusher, pass rusher, pass rusher. And really the difference is, those outside linebackers used to be true edge guys. They're not true edge guys anymore. It's just yeah. we're trying to get penetration. We're trying to get into the backfield. We're trying to stop these plays, and we're going to spill everything to the edge, and everyone else is expected to kind of rally and tackle to the ball. Yeah, um, and that's why the safety position is going to be important, and that's why I think yeah. actually getting a nickel is is going to be important as well. Um, well, this seems kind of dumb uh, based on the discussion that we've had, but let's talk about the um, actual thresholds that they have used since Brian Gutekunst became the general manager of the Green Bay Packers um, in general on the edge, especially with premium picks. Goody is like guys that are six, four plus uh, 260 plus pounds ran the three cone in less than seven Oh five. Really love that sub seven second three cone and the 80th percentile broad. Now that's based on height and weight a little bit, but in general, Let's just call that a 10-foot broad jump. Uh, with that in mind, a couple of the guys that that might fit, especially now that we have at least some NFL combine data, would be Miles Cole from Texas Tech, who, who's interesting. Um, Miles was definitely not a super productive guy at, uh, at Texas Tech. Right outside my initial top 200, he's probably going to have to move up a little bit just because he tested like a space alien, and those guys are a better bet than most. Um, Jared verse well, is probably going to be gone. Do you believe in space? That's yeah, the, do I that's the big question. <laughs> that kid was a safety. We'll have to bring that up with, uh, with the, with the, uh, the gentleman that we're going to do safeties with, um, Adiza Isaac or Adisa Isaac from Penn state kind of hits the numbers, but he's small. Um, and we don't have agility stream cause we don't have agility for anybody because nobody runs the short shuttle or the three cone at the combine anymore. And then uh, the one that's interesting to me, and you said you went back and watched him a little bit, was as far as a traditional Goody edge, Marshawn Neeland hit yeah. kind of everything. And it's not like they've shied away from small school guys before. You know, they've, they've invested in Greg Jennings and they've invested in, you know, uh, Christian Watson and Jordan Love went to Utah State, which is not exactly a power. I mean, they'll they'll go shopping around if the field. I mean, they just burned a top 100 pick on Trucker Craft. So they'll 
they'll go shopping around in the in the mid majors if they need to. Yeah, um, Nealon was a guy I ended up watching last night, basically off of just purely the reaction of uh, what he ended up running. Right, I was like, yeah. this guy ran like a, I think it was like a four point one eight like shuttle or something like that. Ended up hitting a, a good. 40 time. I was like, okay, I, I have to watch this guy. Um, I think the consensus draft board is kind of what I use as like a, a watch list, I guess at this point, I think they have them ranked around the right area, which is, you know, mid to early third round pick. Um, a lot of guys aren't running a lot of these agility drills and, you know, you mentioned that already and I can kind of talk about that a little bit. I mean, it's just the, the push to make the combine a, um, prime time event has changed the schedule for a lot of these guys. Um, they're up super early in the morning and East coast time, right? If, if you're training out in Florida and stuff like that, by the time you're running the three cone and stuff like that, I mean, you're talking about nine o'clock at night plus after having an early day. Right. And from a schedule standpoint, this is a marathon for these guys in terms of how much time you have to spend um, doing medicals, how much time you have to spend doing interviews, all that stuff. And then the actual preparation, um, for, you know, the, the running on the field. Right. And everyone wants to do the actual, um, like pass rusher workouts, right. Or linebackers or whatever you are, right. The dropping back into coverage and doing all that stuff. I'm sure you see all, you know, the gauntlet drill and stuff like that, where guys are catching, Everyone wants to make sure that they, they're available for that. Um, so the first thing to kind of get cut off the board is the three cone shuttle, which unfortunately I think are the most telling drills for the edge rushers. So those are kind of those are kind of data points that if you're not doing estimations based off of what they show on film, which I I think is relatively easy, but it, you know, takes the time investment um to actually be able to do that. Um you have to wait for the pro days. Yeah, exactly. And and the numbers that you mentioned, and I think you, you got to give them credit, you know, and, and I think um, I had him at like 69th or 70th overall. I have a early high round three on him, um, right kind of where, where consensus ended up sort of being uh, not a guy that I thought a ton of kind of early on in the process, but kept kept reading stuff, kept reading stuff. Kept, okay, I'm going to watch five games. I'm going to watch eight games. And, and yeah, I, I, I got a lot of um, – the, the same things that, that people are are saying, and, and this is not a super surprising result to me. I mean, he does look like an athlete. The numbers you talked about, 7.02 seconds, that's the sub-705 that we're talking about on the three-cone, 4.18 on the short shuttle, which is moving, moving. and That's a like a corner. Yeah. That's like yeah. a good corner, a very good corner. Yeah. Yep. Um, And then 4.75 with a 1.66 10, 10 split at 267. It's moving. That'll it's, do. That's moving. That'll do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, from a traditional standpoint, Marshawn Nealon would be a very goody edge. And and uh, we'll see, you know, kind of how they think he might fit into the Halfley system. But I thought he was one of the big winners. And uh, I mean, for me, and it's it's a little bit selfish, but like he's one of the big winners just because he tried. Just, just because yeah. he, he's, you know, he was one of the guys. And I, I think a lot of those guys with round three, round four, round five expectations, they go into the combine expecting to do everything because I, I gotta, I gotta try blow this right. thing up. Right. Um, but that was, that was impressive for sure. Uh, other fits then if we're, we're going to talk about kind of more of the, the 245, the 255 pound range, if you're, you know, correct. And, and that they're, they're now kind of opening the door to these sub two fifty five guys, other, other fits that you might see, um, 25, 41, 58, you're famous for your pass rushers or like quarterbacks take, you know, I think, um, yeah, it's really cool to draft, uh, in a in round five, like that's fun. But if you're going to draft a pass rusher, do it. And that's what they did last right. year that, you know, that's what they did last year. Yeah. And I, th I think the, um, clarity on the present situation kind of, helps us figure out where they're going to end up targeting these guys. I would kind of be surprised if they went pretty early in the draft, just based off of uh, like first round, right? Like I think second round, probably things are back on the table um, just in terms of how important the position is. But in, in the first round, I think 
that's probably off the board now just because they know that they're going to get Preston back. So you got three guys that you're heavily invested in, two that you're invested in long term. If Preston would have been gone, I wouldn't have been surprised if they used a first round pick, though. Um, just because, I mean, remember when they signed Preston's Darius and they drafted Rashawn Gary? Like, that's, yep. you know, a, three is not a, a unheard of number in terms of high investments for edge rushers. It's once you get beyond that, that I think question marks start to pop up. So I do think, you know, you could be looking at a guy on day two, early day three, something like that, um, depending on what they do in free agency, obviously. Let's uh, let's talk about the star of the show yesterday. Chop Robinson, Penn State, one of my guys. I'm, I'm not patting myself on the back, but he was a top 20 guy for me and not for everyone. I think that's pretty, pretty, pretty above consensus even before we had had testing numbers. Um, Number one concern for people, 32 and a half inch arms. That's not great. Um, Braylon Trice has the same problem. Uh, but my God in heaven, um, four, four, eight in the 40 with a 1.54 uh, 10 yard split, verted 34 and a half, 10, eight broad jump, elite explosion. And then uh, the 425 20 yard shuttle might not be 418, but it is 425. That is moving. Uh, elite speed elite ball get off and he is aesthetically the kind of guy that i like unbelievably gifted at getting under offensive tackles without falling down un unbelievably gifted at dipping underneath guys turning the corner and sacking the quarterback and he might not have a second move because if, if your arms are that right. short that small th but you know what if he wins with a speed rush 15 times in a season i don't care I, I I don't care if there's a second move. I I really don't. So, uh, what are what are your thoughts on Chop? Yeah, I think he's really interesting because he's he's so min maxed at so many things, right? Where you talk about you know his speed is great, his length isn't great. Um, he's got to win early on the down, right? He's got to win on the first move, or it's or it's not going to get home. I mean, I could see a wide variety of grades on a guy like that. I I probably wouldn't have him. I, I, I think I'm pretty solidified at the top two edge rushers in this class, and he wouldn't be among them. But then after that, I think anything is pretty much on the table for me. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up being a guy who ends up going top 15 or something like that. I mean, depending on how the needs end up shaking out with uh, how these teams end up filling out in free agency with the edge position at the top of the draft. Because I think I still think the strengths of the class are – you know, it's going to be the offensive line. It's going to be cornerback. It's going to be wide receiver. So if a team doesn't have a need need at edge, those guys probably end up slipping a little bit just because of the other talent at the other positions. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm going to take a guess because we we didn't talk, talk that much before the show. Potentially maybe one of your actual top two guys, Jared Verse. Not sure. Not sure. No. But, oh, okay. It's not. Fair enough. It's not. Um, Verse, I, I would say, would be kind of just from a absolute testing perspective, kind of a, a close marriage between what you're talking about and what Goody used to do um, or has done, I, I should say. You know, uh, six four flat, two fifty four, so not two sixty, but two fifty four, running the forty in a blazing four five eight with a ten seven broad, which is super impressive, and a, a thirty five inch vertical jump. The three cone at seven three is not uh, great, yeah. but you run that again at, at Florida state and maybe all of a sudden at seven, one, you just, you, you, you never know. Um, but, but he's a guy that would have been kind of right on definitely hits the broad jump, um, hits the height, hit very, very close, probably not like a tier one fit, but maybe a tier two fit. Uh, but ultimately I think by running the four or five, eight, by having the, the impressive vert and the, the good 10 yard split, I think he probably worked his way out of anything resembling the 25th pick. Yeah, I don't. I don't think Verse is going to be there. I, I I think NFL teams like him a good bit. The the two guys that I think are the best in the class are still Dallas Turner. Dallas Turner has been my number one guy coming into the year. Okay. I, I I think, yeah, I, I I don't think he's Will Anderson, but I think he's the closest thing to that in this draft class. And then Latu is, yeah, a very so interesting cool. prospect. I mean, from a athletic standpoint, he's everything that you want. The question is just like you know, that, that neck fusion, right? Like how, how do you feel good about that um, moving forward? I mean, that's not something that 
kills guys. Like that's not a reason to not draft a guy fully, but like, um, so for a Packers perspective, like Eddie Lacy got his foot fused, right. Um, when he was coming out of the draft. And that was one reason why he ended up not going in the first round. And he ends up being right. what a one contract player yeah. for the Packers by the end of it. So like Latu, if you only get one contract out of him, what is that worth, worth? You, right? Yeah. So yep. I, I think you have to start doing the math on those kind of things when you talk about the medicals there. Yeah, Latu is my only top 10 guy, only guy I gave a blue chip grade in this entire edge class. And and he's just so dang good, man. Like, again, I don't, I don't think that I'd have him probably where I would have had like a Bosa. I don't think I have him where I would have had a Garrett. The, uh, the Trey Hendrickson comparison is really good to me. I, I, yes. I like that one yep. a lot. Yep. And and uh, certainly not where Trey was picked, but the type of right, right. of player that Trey ended up being. Um, he's my my top guy. The, the, the other one that I want to, just because of the testing, he did not have the, he's a younger guy and, and a smaller guy, but Isaac, the other edge at Penn State, any thoughts on him? Because he he was a younger younger prospect, which Goody has liked in the past, and um, really kind of more in that forty one fifty eight realm, uh, as opposed to especially now. Verse Chop Latu Dallas Turner, who I have literally one overall spot behind Chop. I mean, it's a coin flip between Chop and Dallas Turner for me. I, I love him as a player as well. But when you're talking about maybe using a somewhat premium pick in, in round two. Isaac might be kind of like right in that wheelhouse. Yeah, absolutely. And especially with how some of the other edge rushers tested, I think the other guys in his range um, kind of helped him out a little bit. So like Br Braylon Trice is a guy who Oof, I've, I've always compared him to Derek Barnett. And I think that comparison is starting to stick a little bit more. Um, not be great. Which is like, it, it's good if you take him to be Derek Barnett. But it's not good if you take him, yeah. you know, in the first round or whatever. Or like I guess where Derek Barnett ended up getting drafted, and then Darius Robinson, the kid out of Missouri, who just kind of doesn't really fit a role. He, you usually see those guys drafted like in the fourth round, right? Where you're yeah. like, I don't know where to play him. Let's get him in the room. Let's see if we can like fix his body into one direction or the other, and and get it going. Um, he ended up having a really poor combine, so. Um, I, I think fourth round sub rusher for a team that doesn't have one, he might be sweet. Right. Exactly. But we're yeah. talking about him as a borderline first round pick at this point. Right. And that's, that's the whole funky thing about the draft is you could, it, it's better to talk about the players. Cause who knows where these guys actually end up getting picked. Cause so much of the conversation is just overrated, underrated, right? It's th thumbs yeah, up, thumbs right, down yeah. on, on where they are. This um, is not but, stock exchange though. Shout out to the stock exchange guys. Good. good. <laughs> No problems, but yeah, that it's not really what we're we're trying to discuss. Um, and then the other guy, about... Austin Booker, the Kansas kid, okay, um, he he bombed the combine too. Yes, he um, did. And he was a guy who, you know, early declaration, all that stuff. People thought, you know, he's maybe a top a hundred selection. So I, I just think all of the guys around Isaac doing poorly actually bodes well for Isaac moving forward. So yeah, I think those are legitimate conversations to have. You know, early second round type of thing. Any other kind of fits or any other guys that 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 not necessarily even because this is not necessarily really a combine show. It happens to be being recorded during the combine, but just anybody else, um, not necessarily was like your favorite guys. We'll talk about our favorite guys in the class in just a second, but anybody else that you watched during this process and you're like, hey, Green Bay Packer. Um, just a couple guys that I liked. Um, Dorless out of Oregon. Um, I don't know if I I kind of doubt he's going to play the edge but he's still kind of in that in between body just long as hell explosive as hell knows how to use his length knows how to use leverage i really like him man um i really doubt he makes it to the third round where everyone thinks that uh, you know he's going to end up getting drafted i i wouldn't be surprised if he floats around a uh, top 40 pick uh you know by by the time everything's said and done like his his high his highest level plays are as good as anyone's in the draft. It's just, he's 280. Do you play him at three tech? Do you play him on the edge? You know, all those questions. Um, Gabriel Murphy, the kid out of UCLA, the kid opposite of Latu. I think he's a pretty decent pass rusher. Um, he's a guy that I was exposed to watching Latu and watching the linebacker. Um, Mohamed Kamara is a guy that I've heard a lot of good things about. And Eric, Eric Galco of uh, the East West Shrine Bowl. 
Um, I worked with him at the XFL. He was my boss there and he's sending me all these clips. He's like, you gotta, you gotta get excited about this guy. Um, I haven't watched him like in full, but I've seen the clips. That's a pretty impressive guy to be playing power five football. I don't know how someone didn't get him to transfer up. And then Nelton Caesar is a guy who I didn't really watch this year, but I've watched him in passing. Um, just catching clips of him uh, going against, you know, offensive linemen and stuff like that in the past. Um, and he was a guy who's always been on my radar. So I don't know if how, how well that translates this season, but I've seen him in the past and I liked what he brought to the table. He's kind of another in between kind of guy like Dorless. Yeah. Dorless to me, and I really like Brandon Dorless, but that that's been kind of my conversation about defensive tackles and this isn't the interior. Right defensive tackle show but like you have colby wooden and you have carl brooks you have two of the tweener guys and yeah frankly your three your, your kind of standard looking guy in Devonte wyatt is was not thus far uh really defending the run so you mm -hmm. like Devonte wyatt's darn near a sub rusher and you took two sub rusher body types and not that it would affect like my overall grade on doorless but it would affect my what the hell does he do for the green bay packers conversation about doorless so yeah he's an interesting one all right uh let's let's get at least close to uh wrapping this bad boy up let's talk about our favorite guys in the class not necessarily just our top five you you mentioned some of yours and but I'll, I'll let you go off again um chop robinson is a guy that i definitely am higher than consensus on and that might change now with the combine and that's that's fine i, I like chop quite a bit um Jared Verse, I, I don't know that I'm all that much higher on him than consensus because consensus thinks to be th seems to think he's pretty sweet, an right. older prospect. <laughs> um, and and so that you wonder kind of how much ceiling is there, but boy, with a mid first round pick, I feel like that's just a starting like eight to nine to ten to eleven sack a year type of guy, and that has value. Um, Marshawn Neeland, I liked fine, you know, before and now I'm definitely more interested in. Jonah Ellis um, is another kind of smaller dude. Play Pac-12 ball at Utah. I believe has NFL bloodlines. Not everybody seems to love him quite quite the way that I do. Um, but but he he's a I fun one. Yeah, I watched watch. the two Utah safeties, but I haven't seen him. I yeah, I would. And then the Utah safeties are fun too. And then you mentioned Mo Camara, um, really fun. I his uh, position coach used to work at, at North Dakota State where I where I live. Uh, Buddha Williams is his position coach, and Mo. Um, is, is a shorter guy, and I think even if we are going to talk about um, the like potential speed rusher, he still might end up being too like 6'1, 248 is just maybe not something good he's going to do either way. And but but he's fun to watch. Um, you know, you might get a little bit of Carl Bradford PTSD with a Mo Camara selection, so I get that, but I really think that as a nickel dime rush end like i think as a as a third fourth fifth round guy i would take him around three but if you you know fourth fifth round guy i think he's going to make a team and i think he's going to be good on passing downs and that's um valuable in this league any anybody else that you not necessarily like your favorite guys in the class though you can talk about them but anybody else where you kind of ranked and then you looked at consensus and went huh how about how about that why don't why why no love for my guy uh, not guys that we haven't already talked about. I mean, Turner Law too, they're just simply not going to be there for the backers. Right. Um, I agree. And I yeah, think I I'm agree. a little bit higher on both of those guys than the consensus. I, I, I guess if I'm looking at edges and it's what guys I really want to see in green Bay, just because they're good football players is probably doorless. And then Murphy from UCLA and doorless. I know, you know, you have the interior line question and all that stuff but those are the two guys who kind of stood out to me in terms of watching them and being like oh these guys aren't bad right and you know once you get to day you know mid day two to day three you're kind of squinting your eyes and you're like what can this guy be i think those are two guys where you're like at, at least i can hang my hat on them being able to get after the quarterback right and i think that's kind of what green Bay is looking for at the position Hard to disagree. All right, let's wrap this bad boy up. And this is how we are going to wrap up every single one of the positional previews. Justice, gun to your head. And and let's let's because I think like PFF made this change and it seems like 
Alan Lazard is going to screw this up for everybody. Um, it seems like that comp pick is going to move to round five. So you've got the uh, the the you know the the five picks in the first three rounds that everybody talks about. They have their own round four. They don't have their own round five because that was lost in the Rasul trade. But they will have a comp pick at the end of the round. So by the end of round five, gun to your head, do the Green Bay Packers select an edge rusher? Yeah, I mean, if uh, if I got a bet on one of them, I'll say yeah, just because um, I don't think Goot can help himself, right? <laughs> I, 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 I think he's going to look at guys on the line of scrimmage who are athletic, and he's going to say, you know, at some point I'm going to pull the trigger, and I think – it might surprise people how early it is, right? I, I again, I, I think it's on the table from round two on, depending on what they do in free agency. Now, if they add a huff or something like that in free agency, obviously, you know, bets off the board. Please don't pull that trigger. Um, but I would say, yeah, round five. I mean, they have so many picks that you're not really going to get an edge rusher in round like six or seven, right? That's not how this position works in the NFL. Um, so if you want to have a guy who can be your fourth pass rusher. You're going to have to take him, you know, according to his value, right? A Kingsley and Igbar doesn't fall yeah. in the draft every single season. The Packers lucked out pretty, pretty big um, in terms of landing him. So if they want someone to fill, fill that fourth role, I, I think they're going to have to do it within the first five rounds. Yeah, I agree with you. And and I'm, I'm very, you know, a lot of these prospect primers will, or excuse me, the, the, uh, positional previews will probably do after free agency because of that disclaimer that I think you very rightfully put out there. You know, I, I think um, if they do bring in a Huff or they bring in a Grenard or mm -hmm. whatever, even even your you know kind of older dudes like if they brought in, I a mean, Clowney. cuts haven't even happened, right? So like, right. who knows who's even going to be available? I mean, yeah, people and in I think Los Angeles are talking about, hey, you know, we're going to have to get rid of Mac. We might have to get rid of Bosa. Like, what happens then? Right. Right. And I think that that does become a big part of it because they they do have the young the young assets there. You have a first round pick in LVN, you have a fifth round pick that you kind of like in Kings Anik Bari, you have a UDFA that you kind of like in Brenton Cox, and then you have a long term commitment to Rashawn Gary. So if they do go veteran there, um, they don't need a ton of more young assets at the edge position. But as it stands today. I'm with you. I think that they would take one. Justice, man, thank you so much for uh, coming on here. This was a awesome, you know, kind of test run. I think we nailed it. And I uh, hope everybody really enjoyed this. Yeah, go Pat, go. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast service. We appreciate you so much. How can you help us? Oh, why don't you go ahead and buy that Green Bay Draft Guide powered by Pack Report with promo code DAILY. D A I well L excuse me D A I L Y for ten percent off. Check me out. I'm at Ross Uglum on X, formerly known as Twitter. Justice is at J U M O S Q. Check us out at Pack Report and do all the stuff you're supposed to do here on the Pack a Day podcast. Like, subscribe, click the bell, get the notifications, get all the stuff you're supposed to get. Have a great rest of your day, folks, and go Pack Go. <laughs>